Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Zeb Feldman here, and and this is Adam Gold, SEMA OE3 rep. And we're your business representatives. We are happy that you can join us for just a few minutes today. We want to take an opportunity to discuss extensively the uh, current county vaccine mandate announcement and where that is in terms of implementation, and perhaps most importantly, what you can do about it and what your union is doing to protect you. So uh, is there anything else you wanted to introduce the topic with there, Adam? Yeah, I would just say um, we're making this video because we've gotten quite a few questions over the last few days um, from folks who may not have been able to join some of the site meetings and kind of get up to date um, content info on what's happening. So we wanted to collect everything in one place and hit some of those kind of frequently asked questions and concerns um, and, and give some new information as well as this is a rapidly evolving topic. That's right. And also as part of this discussion, you'll see uh, down below that we've included the links to both of the exemption forms that the county has, one for religious exemption, one for uh, medical exemption. And we're also going to be including a link to some of the details with the letter we sent to county administration that was then in turn copied to the board. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time going, we're not going to spend any time going through the forms themselves or any or much time talking about the particulars of the letter. You might hear us reference the letter, but you can just click on it if you want to read it or miss the e-blast about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's jump right into it. Uh, Adam, why don't you start us off? Yeah, so I think first thing that needs to be said, you know, we, we preface all these conversations with these days is that we want to just remind everyone that um, as a unit, as a union, SEMA is, is, is two things. One, overwhelmingly pro-vaccine, um, and two, overwhelmingly vaccinated, right? So SEMA surveyed um, its membership about two weeks back when it was first in the offing that there might be a mandate. Um, we know that SEMA as a unit is over 84% vaccinated at this point um, and is, is pro-vaccine um, overwhelmingly as well. Uh, with that being said, this is not just an issue about whether SEMA as a unit or as individuals are, are pro-vaccine. This is an issue that intersects with um, your rights as members as well as SEMA's rights as a union, um, as well as the, the path that the counties chose to, to take and try to um, implement the vaccine mandate in this fashion. Um, and, and those things are what we're going to be focusing on. This is not a question of whether SEMA is pro-vaccine or not. SEMA is pro-vaccine and is overwhelmingly vaccinated. Um, that being said, there's a number of other issues that, that do need to be addressed. Um, so first thing we'll do after that is go ahead and catch folks up on kind of what's happened in the last two weeks um, to get us to where we are today um, as of August 12th. Yep, that's right. And so, so that everybody knows SEMA was not caught flat-footed by this at all. In fact, we proceeded uh, about six weeks ago now asking the county to meet about a potential vaccine mandate. Um, we knew that this was going to be a very predictable outcome, if not a mandate, at the very least a discussion of a mandate. So we reached out to Labor Relations formally and said we'd like to start meeting now. Uh, Labor Relations at that time uh, told us, SEMA, there's nothing to meet on. We don't have a policy. We don't have a plan of a policy. As soon as we do, we'll reach out and meet and confer with you. We said, that's great. We understand that a policy might be brewing, right? In all likelihood, it might be. We'd like to meet ahead of time so we can iron out some of those implementation concerns. And we were told, no, it's not necessary. There's nothing to discuss right now. Much to our disappointment, and I think to yielding a poor initial policy, as well. So as you may know, there have been several articles that have come out. One came out in the Mercury News. That was on July 23rd. We again took that opportunity to reach out to labor relations, was again told uh, kind of, you know, county, particular county personality got out ahead of this. They probably shouldn't have done that. Then there was another article on July 30th, this time appearing in NBC News. We again reached out and were told nothing, nothing to see here. Then, of course, it's announced in the media that there is in fact, going to be a vaccine mandate, and it gets rolled out in a unit-wide email, county-wide email, employer-wide email to all of you. And we're copied on it, right? So we've been asking to meet for weeks. We're now copied on it. Then it might appear to some that don't know the background that we weren't prepared for that or we hadn't laid any groundwork as we're demonstrating to you that's, that's furthest from the truth. You can see more of the detail of that in the, in the article, um, the letter rather that we've, we've copied. So now we find ourselves in the situation where we have an announcement 
by the county that there's a vaccine mandate that's rolling out and they will meet with the unions, but there's already an implementation date. That's not how meet and confer is supposed to work. You're supposed to meet and confer ahead of announcing a, 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 a date, an implementation date. And in fact, um, Adam, through the help of our county council, found a really relevant- Sorry, uh, Zeb, through, through the help of OE3's attorneys. Sorry, our, of our house council is what I meant to say. Yeah, our internal OE3 uh, attorneys. Um, was to locate a PERB ruling uh, with the regents of the University of California that just came out uh, last month. Um, and so that's really on point and supports our case that it does need to be go through the, the very specific meet and confer process. So now we find ourselves here where we are meeting and conferring with the county and we're um, exploring what our options are. And we just had an initial meeting uh, with the county. So why don't I turn it over to Adam and he'll talk a little bit about that meeting and what our goals are right now. Right, and, and, and part of what folks will see in that, that initial response we had to the county, one of the points Seema made was, look, we're absolutely confident that in, in fairly short order, we'll be able to find a solution on a vaccine mandate policy that works for our members, for the county, um, and for the public here in Santa Clara, right? Um, and that there absolutely would have been sufficient time to do that if, if the county had agreed to meet and start discussing, you know, the legitimate questions around implementation of such a policy when SEMA first reached out. Um, that wasn't the county's decision. So now we're trying to pick this up on the back end. So we've done we've done several things now in, in the initial meeting with the county, right? The first thing, which you'll also see in the letter, is that um, SEMA first off demanded the county cease and desist implementation. Um, until they have met with us and bargained over impacts, right? So PERB, the Public Employee Relations Board, that, that's that reference, they govern relations between public sector unions and, and their employers, um, has held that the question of whether there is a vaccine mandate or not, that subject is not bargainable. However, what is bargainable are the effects of any such policy. So that means the level of meet and confer, right? And effects and impacts are going to be things like um, what happens to someone who doesn't agree to get a vaccine under the mandate? Uh, what's the timeline for the mandate going to be? All those kind of questions are, are going to be legitimate subjects. And, and as that per ruling held, those, there's an obligation for the employer to, to meet and confer on those before implementing a policy. So because the county didn't do that, point number one we made to the county, both in the letter and in our initial meeting, was um, you need to stop. You need to put an immediate delay on this policy, and we need to address these questions before it's implemented, right? And SEMA is committing that this is not a delayed tactic, right? So the point isn't to just stall this. The point is that one, you're trampling over our member and union rights here and, and your employees' rights to have a voice in this process, what it's gonna look like, um, but that we're confident we can get something in fairly short order. So that question is still outstanding. Um, the county has not yet responded if they're going to put a delay in place or not, um, but we expect an answer on that shortly. Um, Second topic is that, um, you know, uh, we addressed kind of, I would say that the individual details of what this policy is going to look like, right? It's unclear from the policy uh, what qualifies as an exemption under the religious exemption, under the medical exemption. It's unclear what's going to happen to someone, what the possible accommodations are for someone who does not qualify for an exemption. Does that mean the employer is going to immediately terminate that individual? What are other options the county can look at? For example, increased telework for that individual. Um, does this mean because the county's mandating a vaccine that they're now assuming all liability for potential side effects from the vaccine? Is this reportable under workers' comp? Right, that's kind of a sample of some of the questions that we've addressed to, to labor relations that hopefully and normally and in most cases, you would get a sense of, uh, or you would be able to address prior implementation. But again, here, here we are in the back end now. And then finally, I would say kind of last, last major point is wanting to ensure that the county is walking into this decision knowing what the, the impacts and with their eyes open, right? Um, for example, how many staff is the county expecting to lose as a result of implementing a vaccine mandate policy if the result is that folks who don't get vaccinated are going to be terminated? Um, and their decision might be that's, that's an acceptable consequence. We should have some concept of how many that's going to be. And at least the county's response thus far is they have absolutely no idea. Right, and we need to be prepared for those consequences um, as the supervisors, managers, and directors in the county who actually ensure services are delivered, that we know what those consequences are gonna be and we're prepared for them, right? 
Um, lastly, the second major thing SEMA is doing with this, besides addressing the individual policy pushing out, is saying, look, this is largely a crisis of the county's own manufacturing as a result of how they've approached this situation. Um, July 15th, right of last month, was the return to the office date for most people who had been you know, under lockdown and teleworking um, for, for the significant portion of this last year. And uh, the county's message to staff was the workplace is safe. It's time to get back into the office and we'll evaluate what degree of telework there will be after that. And we've seen a lot of departments do, you know, two or three days of telework. Um, however, the message now from the county less than less than a month later has been no, that it's actually the workplace is so dangerous that, you know, we've not only reinstituted mask mandates, but we're mandating a vaccine. And both those things can't be true, right? And that's why the question of telework is inextricably linked to this question of a vaccine mandate, um, vaccine mandate policy. Um, I'll let Zeb speak a little more on that. Sure, and just before we, we turn to telework, another very legitimate question, and one of the reasons why you always wanna go through the crucible of the meet and confer process is you have really intelligent partners like SEMA, like you all as members that are gonna raise great points in the meet and confer process that either explore gaps in the policy that the county wants to implement, or simply we might have a better idea as to how to do it, right? Or bring to point, bring to the light uh, variations. So here's, a, here's an example. We were meeting with them. We did an initial meeting on Monday and we said, okay, fully vaccinated. What does that mean? Uh, the guidance we're expecting from the CDC may well change to include booster shots. Does that mean that fully vaccinated encompasses those booster shots or not? And they just simply had no answer for that, right? So they hadn't even contemplated that. Um, which is, we, we really need to, to, to narrow all that down and make sure that everything that we can commit to is in writing. In addition, many of you know right now that um, the county has committed to have people get tested and get vaccinated on county time at um, two hours, right? And at county expense, they're paying for it. As part of this, we wanna make sure that's codified and in writing so the county just as a policy doesn't decide to not do that anymore. We have no reason to think they would, but we always have to reduce things to writing. So um, Adam brings up a great point, which is this is inextricably linked to telework. That's something that it appears to us the county is really shutting its ears to, that an obvious response to all workers, not just those that don't want to get a vaccine, county workplaces have become more dangerous because of the Delta variant. I understand that a response to that is the vaccine mandate, which is lawful as we can, as we've explored, but that should also allow, the employer should also allow expanded telework, especially where practicable. So we're really, we really are making some very reasonable asks here, right? Okay, so workplaces are getting more crowded as everyone is returning to the workplace. We have the increased danger of the Delta variant because the county ordered everyone back, as Adam pointed out. And then we also have on top of this, the new mask requirements, which just came out a short while ago that the county health officer and all Bay Area health officers ordered. And then on top of that, now we have a brewing mandate for vaccine. Obvious tool in that toolkit is also telework. So let's put that in and maximize it to the extent possible. So that's part of our lobbying effort right now, not only to senior executive management, but also in our discussions with the board. Um, we really want to emphasize that telework point and that that needs to be one of the first responses to the increased danger of telework, not an afterthought that's totally divorced from a vaccine mandate. And that SEMA specifically as a unit being, you know, primarily comprised of knowledge workers um, is, is a unit where many departments are, are well geared and designed for, for telework, right? We know we had many departments that are data driven and can demonstrate that they teleworked at 100% or greater than 100% compared to pre-pandemic levels of productivity as, as an entirely telework department, right? So if the county is making a, you know, cost benefit or a risk benefit analysis, you know, number one priority is to ensure provision of public services, right? That's, that's, that's why the county exists as a structure, right? And if, you know, we have departments that are unable to, you know, provide appropriate levels of service with full telework, then obviously some analysis needs to be made that maybe telework's not appropriate, right? 
That's right. But where we have departments that can telework at 100% efficiency, there's no benefit to bringing those departments back. And if there's no benefit on that side of the scale, then no level of risk is going to be acceptable. And as Zeb said, unfortunately, when the decision was made to bring folks back into the office, uh, effective July, that decision was made you know, back in May or June, we were just in a different situation, right? As I've mentioned, we're seeing high rates of transmission of Delta variant now, even with vaccinated people. The fact is that there is just significant risk now. And this is this is the point at which that decision needs to be reevaluated. Yep, no, that's absolutely right. And so where, where do we go from here and what are the next steps? So, so everyone's aware, we are talking with the Board of Supervisors, we're talking with executive management as we already stated, and we're meeting with labor relations. So we're gonna play those processes out at this moment, we're not asking for members to appear at the board meeting, but we will, board of supervisors meeting, but we will be uh, maybe doing a small presentation or at least meeting with them privately. Um, so those are all in effect. And we again have to complete the meet and confer process. What seems likely, and this is far from a guarantee, but what seems likely at this point in the process is we will likely get uh, a commitment at county cost and expense. We'll get some further, ex for, the, for the vaccine, we'll get some further explanation as to what exemptions are allowed beyond we'll look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Because that's always the response of every employer. We'll look at it case-by-case. -case. Hey, that's just not good enough. You can take in a, a, a thousand applications and then deny all of them and say we looked at them case-by-case. -case. So we want to get more clarity on that. I believe those two are very likely. I also believe it's very likely that we will see an extension of the timeline, right? To allow more opportunity for us and others, we're concerned with SEMA right now though, for SEMA to bargain and complete that bargaining process prior to meet and confer. Again, as Adam pointed out earlier, it's not a delay tactic. This isn't, well, we just wanna kick this out. And by the way, we're not available for the next four weeks, right? That's not at all what we're doing. We wanna fully explore those gaps in the policy and make sure that we all understand what is happening. And if we can prevail on the telework, which is a real coin flip at this point, I don't know where we're gonna land on that. We wanna link that as one of the first responses to COVID rather than a totally separate, separate response. So that's kind of the state of affairs right now with regards to policy. Um, we are gonna be including in this chat, you'll, you'll see in the description, um, the forms, and you'll see the letter that we've sent thus far to the executives. Um, is there anything else you can think of, Adam, that we wanna share with everybody as to where we are right now? Yeah, so one of the most frequently asked questions we have right now is, what should folks be doing with, with exemption forms? Should you That's be right. filling them out and submitting them right now? Um, given that you know, you're know you hearing us say, you know, in site meetings and e-blasts and, and here that we're, we're looking for a delay on this and um, a stay while we sort out a number of these questions. So we have until, um, is that August 20th is the first deadline on there, Zeb? I believe it's August that's, that's 20th. Right, that's right. Yeah, so August 20th in the current version of the policy, which may change, right? We don't have a definitive answer on that yet, but August 20th is gonna be the first date by which um, county employees will need to either show vaccination, right? If you're already vaccinated, you just, you prove that. Um, or if you're, you're unvaccinated, you need to either be scheduled for an initial vaccination shot that you can show, or you need to have submitted an exemption form. Um, so, you know, members are absolutely welcome to submit those early if they want, if you're uncomfortable with it and you're hoping to see a policy change in line with some of the things SEMA is advocating for, um, you have eight days, right, until that deadline approaches, and then you need to um, do one of those two things, either under the current policy schedule a vaccine or submit an exemption form, right? Um, so you're going to want to make sure that date doesn't pass without one of three things happening, right? Either submitting one of those two forms, scheduling a vaccine, or ensuring, you know, you've seen a message from SEMA that says there's been a, a change in this date. Um, but that's the date you need to mark on your calendar, be aware of it, um, where all, all employees under the current policy will need to do one of those two things. Again, this is subject to change. We just walked through, you know, what SEMA's response has been, but we, we don't yet have an answer from the county. You know, the county initially committed to getting an answer back by Tuesday on that question. Will there be a delay? We expect one shortly. You know, ESA has been in labor relations, have been meeting with um, other bargaining units, uh, you know, after they met with SEMA. Um, we're expecting some response soon on this. 
we don't have one yet. We'll share one as soon as we have. That's the date, though, that folks need to be aware of um, and ensuring that um, they don't let pass without uh, making some move or ensuring that SEMA's gotten the date pushed back. That's right. And also, as a reminder, the current mechanism for demonstrating that you are vaccinated is an attestation, right? So you're saying, I have been vaccinated, and you're signing it and, and providing that to the county. And that has serious consequences where everybody should be truthful in that. There should be no deception in whether you are, you are or not. So that's a reminder. And another thing is what we just mentioned about the importance of this date. It's probably not that important of a date for someone who's already fully vaccinated, right? So the vast majority of our members, somewhere in the neighborhood of mid 80s, according to our data, uh, it are already vaccinated, full, uh, either partially or fully, and you're on. You're already already in a in a good state if that's the situation for you. But for those that are unvaccinated, that's where all those timelines I've just mentioned come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then our commitment to you is to share any information as soon as we get it. You're going to see that from an e-blast or possibly a similar video to this. Uh, and if we do need help um, with appearances at the board, individual stories, or so forth, uh, we certainly will make a call for that. I think that's about it. Do you think that's right, Adam? Yep, I think that's it. Um, as always, you, you should you know reach out to, to one of your reps, either myself or Zeb, um, if you have questions, concerns about you know the, the exemption process. Um, we will have updates out to folks um, both at site meetings and, and via email and e-blasts over the, the coming days. Um, as we said in the beginning, this is likely to be a you know rapidly evolving topic.